So the talk of today is about RabbitMQ, how to build a data ingestion system with Rabbit. This is a one hour talk that I should compress into 20 minutes, so <laughs> let's see how it goes, plus my jet lag. Uh, that's a book, contacts, whatever. Uh, the idea of the talk is to kind of say what can be done with Rabbit, not necessarily how to do it. We have plenty of tutorials on our documentation on the website, so if you really want to see the code for Node.js, of course, uh, Java, PHP, uh, Python, Clojure, .NET, Haskell, whatever, we have it there. And yeah, this is an actual tweet, what even is a RabbitMQ? <laughs> So Rabbit is a multi-protocol multi messaging server. It supports ANQP by default. Basically, the big banks in the States created ANQP or started the ANQP protocol or project as a way to spend less money. Not sure how that succeeded there in doing that, considering the 2008 crisis, but that's outside of the conf. Uh, and yeah, Rabbit supports an MQP by default, and then MQTT, which is a protocol like for the Internet of Things and stuff like he was just showing. It's also used, for example, by the chat on, on Facebook, on iOS, they use MQTT. And Stomp is a text-based protocol that, for example, is used at the New York Times for WebSockets because it's a text-based protocol. So in JavaScript, if you want to do browser messaging, Stomp is the best protocol for that. And it's also used in Switzerland at uh, CERN, for example. So if you want to read more, this the, the blog post. In Rabbit, it's a polyglot system, so you can connect from all these uh, clients and more. Of course, Node, uh, Ruby, Erlang, PHP, Java, .NET, uh, Clojure, Haskell, and many more. The thing is that the, most of these clients, or actually, yeah, all of them are maintained by the RabbitMQ team, so they are all well-maintained libraries, so that's what we want to believe. Uh, I'm the responsible for the PHP library, for example. Uh, yeah, is there anybody using Rabbit? Yes, Instagram, Indeed, Telefonica, Mercado Libre, New York Times, Mozilla, the company that does the effect, the special effect for the Lord of the Rings, or now the Hobbit, they use Rabbit, and many other companies. Next, how do you actually use Rabbit? So I have a simulator here. This is the only probably JavaScript part of my talk. Uh, by the way, I if yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to. Uh, let's let's move on. <laughs> let's not get into finals of South American championships. So let's let's focus on the talk. Woo. So in Rabbit, what you want to do usually is to have a producer that wants to send data to a consumer. And the way to do that, the producer actually needs an address, which is called the exchange in RabbitMQ or in ANQB. So the publisher will connect to the exchange and will start sending uh, messages to the exchange. But the messages just die there. What's the reason? Because we don't have any queue bound to the exchange. If we, if we bind a queue to the exchange, and then we send messages, the messages are routed to the exchange. Of course, this is doing queuing. You can see a six there. I mean, if RabbitMQ doesn't do queuing, you can really kick me out, put me back in the cachola, and send me back to Carmelo, because like, that's the basic thing that Rabbit should do, right? <laughs> Bo. <laughs> so then the, the consumer can subscribe to the queue, and there you can get the messages to, to from the queue to the consumer, and if you want to speed up things, like, 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 for example, you go to the subte metro and you you want to buy tickets and it's kind of going a bit slow. Then of course the government will add more people there to work and sell you tickets faster. They always have coin and, and like change. That's uh, very typical to get coins there. And then, then Rabbit will do. I mean, if you have more consumers, it will do round robin and send messages across the, the consumers doing kind of round robin. So this is the basics of an NQP. Uh, you have the producer that wants to send data to some consumers. The data is sent to an exchange, that's the address, and the, from the exchange is routed to the queue. Just to explain this a bit more, and then I move on with the talk. 
You may wonder why you need an exchange. Why just not send the data stra straight to the, to the queue? Like, why don't take, por qué no te tomaste un buque bus hoy en vez del el coso ese en el delta? Eh? En fin. <laughs> uh, the people watching this uh, <laughs> streaming will be like, who's this crazy guy? Like, what? Anyway, so the, the idea of the exchange is, is a routing component inside Rabbit that implements three, uh, sorry, three algorithms at, at least. Uh, there is the direct exchange, the fan out, and the topic exchange. The idea of the direct exchange is that you can actually route messages to multiple queues based on the routing keys. So to put an example from Switzerland, when you go to buy tickets to the train station, you can say, I want uh, international tickets, or I want uh, local tickets. So when you arrive to the, to the station and you say, I want to buy an international one, they will give you, a, they will print a ticket saying you are on the queue for international, which, as usual in Switzerland, they, they are not so friendly with foreigners, so they don't have anybody to sell international tickets. But if you buy and buy, they are really friendly with foreigners, by the way. And they, if you want to buy local tickets, then they go to the other queue. And of course, you can add consumers to this queue. That's um, as usual. So the exchange, in the case of the direct exchange, is choosing queues based on the routing keys. Here, uh, you cannot see it so well, but it says international, and the other binding key says local. So in messaging, you usually have a, an envelope that has like a routing key in this case, like the address where you want to send the message, and you have the content. RabbitMQ should not check the content as the guy from the post office should not do. Uh, the, the message rabbit will just check this envelope, headers, routing keys, and whatnot, and decide where to route the messages. And with the other algorithms, we can do more advanced things, like with the topic exchange, which I'm not going to show because it's going to take a bit of time, you can actually use some kind of patterns to decide how to route messages. So it's a bit more advanced. If you use logging, for example, it's really easy to say, I want to listen to logs, which are warnings coming from the application one on server one, for example. And I only want to listen for logs coming from server two, but whatever they are, warnings, error, info, I don't care. You can use some patterns to, to implement that. So that's how NQP kind of works. Uh, we have the producer sending data to consumer. The exchange, we have an algorithm that will route messages to queues, and then the data will arrive to the queue. In Rabbit or in NQP, there are many things that we can add to this mix. For example, consumers on this side can decide to act the message. That is to confirm to the broker that the message was successfully processed. The publisher can request the same from the broker. The publisher can request to the broker to confirm when an F sync was sent to the hard drive to actually persist the messages. RabbitMQ will do that every 200 milliseconds. If, let's say, you have a cluster with five rabbits and you told Rabbit to replicate to three nodes, when those three nodes did the F sync, then Rabbit will send this confirmation back to, to the publisher. And some more things. Based on this is what we can implement the problem solution that I want to show you. So let's say we have a distributed app. If you can see that this is related to the Amazon uh, availability zones or regions, actually. So you have Brazil, Virginia, Ireland, and Singapore. Or Uruguay, because if you leave Uruguay, nobody knows what Uruguay is, except maybe Argentina. They know it's a province to the east. <laughs> Besides that, like you go to holidays there. <laughs> and Norway, did you say Norway? Yeah, Norway. Anyway, so you want to send all this stuff. I mean, you are collecting data here. Think, for example, you have a game application. This happened, uh, it's a real use case. Some users had their game app collecting data all over the world, and they wanted to analyze the logs in the state, probably to detect cheating or stuff like that. So they want to replicate the data. This looks like JavaScript, but actually it's Erlang, with a very <laughs> interesting syntax. Uh, sorry for showing some Erlang here. Um, 
How do you send data to Rabbit? You get a connection and you get a channel, and of course there are options to, to open the connection. I'm not going to go there. And once you have a channel, you will send a command saying exchange declare the exchange name and the type of the exchange direct uh, in this case. And then, if you cannot read that, it's, this is the very reason why Node.js kind of beat Erlang on popularity. <laughs> Who can read that? Uh, so I'm sending a message, basic publish, to some exchange, and the message has some properties and some payload. And on the consumer side, I do the same. I get connection and channel, and on the channel, I create an exchange, I create a queue, and then I connect the queue to the exchange. Once I have that, I tell Rabbit I want to start consuming messages, and then I start looping to get uh, the messages from Rabbit and do something with the messages. So, this is all nice. We have this deployed on each region uh, in the world, but we want to replicate data. So, we want to be hired by the NSA with all things and send everything to the, to the states. How do we do that? Of course, we can have our own solution. As you can see, one exchange can have more than one queue bound to it. So we can just add a parallel process that is just replicating data coming into an exchange to a remote uh, machine. But the problem that we may have with that is that what happens if the remote server is offline, like how we prevent unbound local buffers, like we cannot replicate data, but we are collecting them in queues, and then those queues start growing and growing and growing. We may run out of disk space or memory or something like that. How do we prevent message loss? What happens if the message was written to the network, but the remote machine crashed, then we lost the message, or we were not even able to write to the network or whatever? There is a meteorite falling on the other side of the world, I don't know. How do we prevent to send the data that we don't want there anymore? Like, in messaging, it's very common that we, like, we have, let's say, 10,000 messages per second or 100,000 messages per second. Those numbers in messaging are not big numbers. Uh, like, when people say this is a scale problem and, you, and they mention 1 billion messages per day, that's nothing. 1 billion messages per day is actually 11,000 per second. So, for messaging apps, it's low, actually. That means some data can be really old and we don't want it on the remote machine, for example. Of course, we can implement all this stuff with Rabbit uh, on our, ourselves, but Rabbit offers a better solution, which is uh, the Federation plugin. This is a plugin that comes directly with Rabbit. When you install Rabbit, you can just enable the plugin, and it can do replication across many data centers. You can mix Erlang and RabbitMQ versions. Uh, yeah, sorry, Rabbit is not written in, in Node. Uh, supports network partition, that is, if the remote server is offline, this federation thing knows what to do, or should know what to do. And you can tell what to federate. If you enable federation, doesn't mean every message will be replicated. You can tell Rabbit, I want to replicate this and not that, for example. And you cr can create topologies like this one. You can say, this is an upstream server, and the data will flow to the downstream servers in like this uh, topology. You can do like a, a circle and tell Rabbit how many hops the messages can do, so you don't have like an, an infinite loop. And yeah, it's just a plugin, and internally it's just using queues and exchanges, so it's not seen magical that you couldn't implement. The thing is, it's really there. Uh, many companies use it, actually, in production. Big companies, like the one in charge of paying the salaries in the States, is using this. So if this doesn't work, I will probably not be here. I will be floating in the, in the uh, Tigre Delta, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> this is very dark now. <laughs> uh, it's the lack of mate. You know, when an Uruguayan starts lacking mate, it's like I'm kind of shaky now. And you can configure it at runtime using parameters and policies. Those commands enable the plugin and let you manage the plugin. And then how do you actually federate something? You just tell Rabbit, I want to create a parameter of the Thai Federation upstream called my upstream, and then you tell uh, Yuri where to connect. And that's it. Rabbit will know how to connect to that. And then you tell Rabbit, 
every exchange whose name starts with AMQ dot, in this example, it could be uh, images, logs, whatever, that exchange will be federated and replicated. And that's it. By doing that, Ruby will set up like uh, this thing here. This is your upstream uh, server, the federated one. Imagine this link is not there. Let's say this is Brazil and that's the state. You have your publisher sending data to the exchange and in the queue here some consumers processing data. Fine. When you do these two commands, Rabbit will create this ghost queue there. It will create this link. And the bindings that you see there, it will be replicated here. So this, this queue up there will know what to send to the remote server. And the remote server originally had like one publisher, two queues, and suddenly started getting messages from a remote machine. What this happens? Uh, is that we don't need to do anything. We just enable the plugin, and then we have the replication uh, for free. To configure the federation, we can set parameters that are uh, JSON objects, like this one, for example. And you can set, for example, to prevent unbound buffers, you can tell expires. If I cannot replicate messages uh, after n milliseconds, then you can delete that queue, for example. Or if the message is older than n milliseconds, don't send it to the remote machine. You can set uh, max hops. You can tell uh, Rabbit how, how many servers the message can keep replicating to. You can have the act mode to, to do speed versus no message loss. Uh, on confirm, when the remote machine tells me uh, I brought this message to the hard drive, the local or the remote server will delete the message. On publish, as soon as I put the message on the hard drive, um, on the hard drive, on the network, it will be deleted. And no act mode is the living la vida loca or the alta replication version, let's say. Uh, and yeah, it's the fastest one, but you could lose messages. That's the URI you can use and the docs how to set it up. You can configure it on, on the command line, the, or you can do it using an HTTP API that Rabbit has to administer the whole server or on the management interface that is like a web browser interface. And with federation, we can just do that. We can uh, do this replication uh, for free, let's say. N not part of the talk, because there are only 50 more seconds. We have some blog posts about queuing theory and how to improve the performance of your Rabbit apps. I recommend that you go there. I recommend that you read this book, which has queuing theory applied to computer systems, which is really good if you want to improve the performance of your apps. It's a very, very good book. There are stuff about how to scale the setup that I'm not going to cover, mostly about how to do sharding with Rabbit, how to shard queues. And to end the slides, with Rabbit, what we can do is to get data in at least with three different um, protocols, you can mix them, you can publish using MQTT and then process using ANQP, for example. You can have this uh, Internet of Things uh, devices all sending data, but then using Java or Node, you can process everything using ANQP on the back end. With Federation, we can do this distribution. Then you didn't see it, but with sharding, we can scale horizontally with, with, with queues. And then do some load balancing with federated queues that we also didn't cover today. Credits, questions, no, <laughs> unless you have mate, of course. And thank you very much. <laughs>